place, beautiful place. You feel the power from the area and Haida people lived all around the islands. And um, you can dig anywhere and find stuff, you know, there's, and we've been there for, well, we have a story when uh, Raven discovered man there, you know, and created man and woman. And we populated the islands um, in the beginning. But physical evidence they're finding uh, over 10,000 years ago, 12,000, 15,000, I don't know, somewhere around there. I mean, that's when there's of us being around. And we got stories of the supernaturals rising out of the sea on, a, on the rocks and that and becoming the lands, right? And um, so we were around a long time. Each clan, or names of the clan, actually comes from the village we come from. For example, Chach. Chach is a, a village where my ancestors came from, and we're a matrilineal society, and, and the people of Chach, we have a certain combination of crests that define who we are, and every 
plan has their own combination. You can have as many as 12 crests. And it, it really depended on the history of that plan, on how they accumulated them.
and provided training programs for museology. And so in those sort of 25 to 30 years, we have had about 50 graduates from all across the country um, come and work in the museum, going through a training program in conservation and in research, in um, collections management, and they work with all the various parts. They go back, many of them have gone back into the community, into the um, First Nations um, cultural center. So we've got a lot of input back and forth. And they've also found jobs. We've hired some, and galleries hired some, and um, they've been wonderful colleagues um, and partners. The decision by the Canadian Museum of History and the McCord Museum to jointly travel the exhibit of historical Haida objects was an opportunity to reflect changes in Aboriginal and Canadian society. Haida life spirit art builds on but does not significantly alter the McCord's exhibit of historical materials. Robert Davidson's participation focused our attention on the objects and the artifacts themselves. Objects carry oral histories and traditional values for generations and across communities. And Mr. Davidson's selections from the McCord collection, together with his commentary, illuminate many of these threads. The exhibit also draws on his extensive knowledge of high material culture, his traditional carving techniques, cultural protocols, and knowledge of um, family histories. Like the 19th century artists whose works are highlighted, Mr. Davidson's experience in creating jewelry and masks and performance pieces, and he's raised many totem poles, including the very first totem pole um, to be raised in his community, has demonstrated his understanding both of the functionality of these pieces that you would see in the exhibit and a powerful artistic vision. This new version um, expands the original <coughs> theme of the grammar of the art form to encompass a broader view of Haida life and culture, both past and present. Having the Haida Gwaii Museum join us as partners has played a central role in the process. This Haida Gwaii Museum, and this is the entranceway to a very large complex, has become a space for exhibitions, for workshops, for celebrations, and when needed, a place where you can carve your totem pole or your canoe in a um, It's become a cultural force in the community, and it has become an archive of images and materials used for programming on the island, and also they are very generous in sharing the materials with museums around the world. As one component in this partnership with the Canadian Museum of History, um, they incorporated a training program for younger Haida curators uh, in the selection of the images and the quotes, and um, it gave these young curators a voice and a presence in, in the development of this exhibit, and it's been just wonderful to have. The other important contribution for me as a curator was that um, the museum kept the Haida community informed about what the show was about, what we were doing. I got feedback from the community about any concerns, um, and it really has resulted in a strong partnership between um, the Canadian Museum of History and the Haida people. So, the Canadian Museum of History for this project has been to bring the individual, the institutional, and the community contributions into a new framework. And by broadening these themes, it has incorporated new elements in telling the Haida story. The original selection of the McCord collections highlighted art forms in wood, stone, and horn, forms that Robert Davison as a carver and an artist was, was very um, clear in his vision in picking these pieces. But they are forms that were traditionally done by male artists, and but Haida women were also renowned for their skills as artists, but in weaving and sewing. So the Canadian Museum has added textiles and basketry to the selection of artifacts to give visitors a better understanding of 19th century um, Haida life and culture. And completing the exhibit, when you go up or if you can see it sometime, is a selection of modern artifacts, contemporary works of art. Uh, by Haida, uh, modern Haida artists. And they are objects which are bought and used by the Haida themselves, um, or they are made for sale to the non-native community. And they're a very good example 
of innovative use of materials. Uh, many of the artists are working in bronze, in glass, um, in new media, new formats. And they are being very innovative with the designs. And so it's like a fresh voice at the end of the exhibit. Um, it's the film production, which you would see, is also, as I said, allows you to see um, the artists' voices much more and what's happening and how they're producing it. Uh, I'd like to take I'd like to take the remaining time for my own talk to give you two curatorial voices. Um, I'm going to read from a background paper on this uh, exhibit prepared by Nika Collinson, who is singing um, with Robert Davidson on uh, Anthony's drum. She's a, a remarkable person. She's a curator at the Museum of Hyde and Hyde. Um, she has been in the forefront in the attempt to revitalize and retain and encourage the use of traditional languages, of music, performance, and ceremonial practices. Um, she's also been a very important person who's worked with many museums in helping to co-curate exhibits. Of, um, and her voice is heard at many national and international forums, speaking on behalf of the Haida people, speaking on what's happening in the community. So Nika um, wrote this paper, and um, I think what she has to say is, is very important. So she says, our extensive oral histories are kept intact by this professional storyteller who reached back to times before humans lived on Earth. Told in the Haida language, events of the past could be narrated by a storyteller word for word, inflection for inflection, exactly as he had learned it from his predecessors exactly as he would train his successor. Historically, every Haida artist, every Haida clan had a storytelling, a position of great responsibility. And the Haida language in which these stories were told is not related to any other language in the world. Born from the lands and waters of Haida Gwai, Haida Kiel is not just a language, it's a different way of thinking, a different way of seeing the world. It's Haida knowledge, history, and wisdom stored. It defines our intrinsic relationship to the lands, waters, airways, and supernatural beings of Haida Gwai, that which makes us Haida. And in the beginning, there were only supernatural beings. The earth was covered in salt water, and it was both light and dark. Haida oral history say we come from the ocean, some descending from supernatural beings, like the killer whale, as re rendered by contemporary artist Don Jonas from the daughter of Fung woman and others from the daughter of Creek woman. And so others come from those who washed ashore inside giant clam or cockle shells. Every clan has its own origin story. Each is a story that comes from the ocean. The creation of Haida Gwaii in North America and the geographical and supernatural events that followed, living in grasslands with standing heat waves, finding refuge during the ice age, Surviving floods and tsunamis, <coughs> moving with the rising and lowering of the sea levels, taking the first tree to grow on Haida Gwaii as a crest are recorded in the oral histories. The waters eventually settled, and Haida Gwaii provided our ancestors with the bounty of food, water, shelter, and inspiration, just as it does for the Haida today. About 6,000 years ago, the red cedar tree grew on our lands and islands and became and we became dependent upon this tree, and our ancestors using it to make most things needed to survive and to prosper. And of all the cedar creations, the Haida Canoe was perhaps the most important, as we became seafaring people. And taught that by the supernaturals, our ancestors engineered canoes up to 24 meters long, permitting ocean travel between villages on Haida Gwaii and to offshore fishing grounds. These vessels also provided access to the Pacific Northwest Coast and beyond, greatly advancing our economy and technologies. And oral histories say these canoes took the ancient Haida on much longer journeys as well, across the ocean to distant lands, now thought to be Japan and Hawaii. The origin of Haida art is also credited to the supernaturals, as is most Haida knowledge and technology. The first carving of the first totem pole belonged to supernatural beings, and were discovered in the ocean by our ancestors. Weaving was taught by the supernaturals. Songs were, and still are, a 
acquired from the supernaturals. I know oral histories also tell of strangers who happened upon our islands. The first accepted documented contact with Europeans took place over 230 years ago in July of 1774, when the Haida encountered Juan Perez and his crew on the Spanish vessel, the Santiago, off the north coast of Haida Gwaii. The explorers noted in their journals that we already had iron and copper and were well experienced in trade. And this is a drawing by the famous uh, Haida artist Bill Reed, showing the first encounter. In 1778, Captain Cook arrived in the waters of the Pacific Northwest. Exchanging iron wares for the luxurious pelts of the sea otter, he then set sail to Asia. And upon reaching China, he found that, this, that the Chinese furs were the, the great demand for Chinese furs. News of the sea otter first spread quickly, and over 50 years, close to 200 ships arrived in the shores of Haida Gwaii in search of animal pelts and later in search of a Haida art. While this two new technology brought quicker and greater wealth and greater access to iron and new forms of technology, it also brought great troubles. The sea otter was hunted to near extinction, our social structure was thrown out of whack, and alcohol was introduced. Distrust and disharmony between coastal First Nations and European traders soon followed. In the mid-1700s, an early smallpox e epidemic damaged fishing populations, possibly traveling the trade routes faster than the Europeans themselves. But it was a smallpox epidemic of 1862 and subsequent diseases like tuberculosis, which ravaged the communities of the Pacific Northwest Coast. This near annihilation of the people and of the knowledge, history, and tradition that went with them marks the beginning of the silent years. By the late 1800s, missionaries had arrived on the shores. The well-intentioned wanted to help, and to some extent they did, but they could not or would not understand their way of life, discouraging or forbidding our ceremonies and customs. And during this time, and far into the 20th century, high degrees were desecrated, the skeletal remains of hundreds of our ancestors were taken, and thousands of cultural treasures stolen by various Indian agents, missionaries, anthropologists, and explorers. What wasn't stolen was given under duress. At the beginning of the 21st century, and really towards the end of the 20th century, one begins to see this sort of revitalization. This is a contemporary um, photo taken at a, at a potlatch not so long ago. And Nika continues, by the beginning of the 21st century, the remains of 460 ancestors have been located and repatriated as have cultural treasures. And the Haida and museums have forged positive relationships along the way. Local churches have found ways into working in harmony with Haida members, even incorporating some of their values and beliefs into the services. Positive changes have been made to the Indian Act in the last decades, and Canada's last residential school closed in 1996. In 2001, six Haida poles representing the six main southern villages and their many clans were raised in six days. And this picture was taken at one of the pole raisings in, in 2001. Um, this was the first step for the 50,000 square foot Haida Heritage Center, su supported by the, both the uh, federal government um, as uh, by the provincial government. And it opened in, with much fanfare in 2008. In 2010, the Haida Nation gained proper say of the management of the lands and waters, and half the land is protected. In 2010, the federal government and provincial government joined with the Haida Nation to protect the waters um, surrounding Guayanas, which is a international uh, UNESCO site, making this small area in the southern part of Haida Gwaii the only place on earth that is environmentally protected from mountaintop to seafloor. And Nika concludes, having out of necessity and survival adapted to the modern way of life, we now find ourselves walking in two worlds every day, Western society and Haida society. And I think Emily can also speak to that a little bit. So the second curatorial voice that I think to conclude with is my own. Um, I'm interested in collections and how objects came into museums and how Aboriginal communities can use them to revitalize knowledge. Um, 
and to show the contemporary of this story. I'm also interested in how museums use objects to educate others and to incorporate multiple voices. And it's interesting that despite the relatively small population, particularly following European contact and the remote location of their islands, higher material culture is well represented in North American and European museums. Performance masks, ceremony regalia, feast dishes, and the tools required for hunting, fishing, and carving are frequently shown on exhibit, and they occupy many shelves in the storeroom. Argelite sculptures in particular are well represented in various collections, from a single or small sample to the hundreds of pieces in the Royal British Columbia Museum, the Canadian Museum of History, and remarkably, there are 500 Archerite pieces in the Florida Museum um, of, of Natural History. And one reason for the surprising size of such collections may lie in the easy accessibility and availability through purchase or exchange. The height of more practice traders with enticing merchandise and offer in well-established markets along traditional trade routes. And the height didn't simply wait for the Spanish and British or the Russians um, and the Americans to arrive in their borders. They incorporated new ports of call. In the mid-19th century, canoe loads of potatoes, fish oil, Haida art, um, and other items were traveling down to Victoria and Vancouver. They had, they went to the canneries and the trading posts and a growing number of small towns established near the Hudson's Bay companies were also venues for profitable exchanges. The Haida artists, for example, Charles Edenshaw and his wife Isabel sold their painted baskets during seasonal visits to the local canneries. And Indian agents and missionaries encouraged the continued production of basketry carvings by finding new markets, promoting exhibits at local agricultural fairs, and occasionally becoming middlemen for collectors. At the same time, there was a growing history, a uh, growing interest in establishing public history museums in the late 19th century. And it coincided with the belief that Aboriginal people and populations were disappearing. Museums in Europe and North America contacted collectors on the Northwest Coast or sent museum staff to acquire a representative range of material culture. Some of the collectors were scientists, others were, um, were the first generations of anthropologists like Franz Boas and Edward Sapir um, to work with communities to record word lists, to record um, stories, languages, and traditional um, objects. And they asked many people to recreate uh, traditional objects of carving or weaving. So this is a slide of the Canadian Museum of History's collection. We have about 23,000 objects documented as or attributed to Haida manufacture. And it shows sort of the representative range of material. We have a great deal of tools, um, fishing and hunting tools, and, um, and also a lot of contemporary works like Archimite and prints and paper. At the bottom is what the McCord collection, the McCord um, exhibit uh, has, the McCord Museum has. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the collection of the McCord pieces because that's what's shown, predominantly shown um, in this exhibit of this movie. Mm -hmm. So the historical objects in the exhibit height of life, spirit, art, um, were collected by a man named George Mercer Dawson. And we also at the Canadian Museum have about 35 people, uh, 35 pieces. He went, he was up in the Haida village during the eight, 1878. And uh, to do a survey, he was um, a geologist, he was a remarkable man. He was born in 1849 in Nova Scotia. He grew up in a family of scientists and scholars. And during his childhood, he developed an interest in geology, fossils, and natural history. When um, he was about 11, he contacted contracted tuberculosis of the spine, which you see here is a shorter um, figure there, and was quite hunched back. And he had headaches and a great deal of pain, but he participated in important surveys and mapping of the Canadian wilderness. In 1873 and 74, Dawson was appointed to the British North American Boundary Commission as a geologist, naturalist, and botanist. 
And in his letters back to his family, he describes these very difficult excursions of walking and portaging and canoeing across 800 miles of prairie landscapes. However, despite this, his observations and analysis led to important scientific publications, contributed to theoretical knowledge of geology at the time. He is credited through his studies of the local soil conditions with helping to encourage the settlement of Western Canada. Dawson kept daily journals, and he wrote of his observations, both of geological, botanical, and um, ethnographic observations. He recounted the progress of his trip through the Queen Charlotte Islands on almost a daily basis, and he noted the weather and the roughness of the seas, and even when he ate breakfast. And in and among these entries are detailed accounts of the people he met and the events he had attended. And this is one in which he um, happened upon um, the community holding a traditional potlatch or a traditional feast. The account of this potlatch continues with a description of the music, the regalia, and the dance movements, and word portraits of the individuals and small groups that have specific roles to play throughout the evening. He also talked about the acquisition of the various objects um, that he acquired during his survey. And uh, this is an example both of the first encounter in which um, he began the trading and then the return um, by Chief Skadan um, to continue uh, this useful um, exchange of material. And Dawson also talks about about two days later a uh, group of Simshan, who are neighbors on the mainland of northern uh, British Columbia, who arrived in several canoe loves to trade boxes of fish oil, or ulican oil, with the Haida in exchange for blankets. And Dawson's description of this sort of friendly reception and the expectations of knowing that one box of Simshan fish oil will be about five to six Haida trade blankets suggests that even though the population was greatly reduced, um, the traditional patterns of trade and exchange of the earlier generation was still going on. Dawson made only one extended trip to Haida Gwaii, but his field work and geological survey continued for several more years. And during this time, he crossed thousands of kilometers in British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, and the Yukon. And his analysis of the gold deposits in the Yukon is said to have contributed to the rush to find that gold. He was appointed director of the Geological Survey in 1898 and was instrumental in establishing the first national collection of ethnographic materials, which forms the basis of the Canadian Museum of History. He died in Ottawa in 1901. I'm concluding, pass this on to Evelyn, but I wanted to sort of point back to the changes of exhibits and how exhibits are really um, a kind of organic exchange, continuation of conversations between people and institutions. And often the most successful of these exhibits are those that incorporate multiple voices from these discussions. And Haida uh, life, spirit, and art has been fortunate in being the topic of many fruitful discussions between Robert Davidson and the McCord Museum, between the McCord and the Canadian Museum of History, between the Canadian Museum of History and the Heidegger Museum. What you find on display is a finished exhibit, but these conversations that we've had and that we will have about the changing relationships between museums and Canada's Aboriginal communities will continue. In this closing shot, this is a picture of Evelyn's beautiful daughter <laughs> dancing a beautiful world that we, that the museum commissioned for its new permanent exhibition in the gallery. And the conversations that we had about the development of that robe and of the place in the gallery and participation in the um, storyline and the rest was, was just a wonderful experience in the contributions we've made. And so I'm very pleased that everyone is here tonight to continue the conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
been great to be here with Leslie. Uh, she curated that show, and it, and it was the first time she'd seen it, so it was so much fun to watch uh, her see the um, culmination of years of work. It, it was quite an honor. And it's uh, an honor to be invited here, hosted by the um, Canadian Embassy, and their generosity is, uh, has uh, it is wonderful, and thank you for the Institute for inviting me. Um, I was happy to see the um, last slide there when I first saw it. Uh, I'm just uh, really fortunate that my two daughters have carried on with weaving, and uh, that's pretty much what my talk is, is going to be about, is, uh, is a continuation of uh, weaving in my family and with my culture. It's not been that long ago that the Haidas did live within their culture on their uh, in the island environment, and uh, we lived on a very uh, a very sharp zone between water and forest on the beaches of Haida Gwaii. And uh, when I was invited to come to Greece, uh, I wanted to research more about the Greek people. And it was amazing how many similarities that um, I found. And one of the main similarities was that we were seafaring people. And uh, to uh, be at the mercy of the power of the water and to gather within our land, it created a very complex culture. And uh, if you notice with Leslie's slide presentation, uh, a lot of the objects that are in her museum were collected and started being collected in the 1880s. And uh, my grandmother, my naughty Selena, was born in that last decade of the 1880s. And uh, when she was born, they were still raising totem poles and they were still traveling between their villages and their different places of gathering food um, by canoe. So um, I'm very fortunate to have my Nani Selena in my life, and she lived until she was 96, So, uh, and she lived right next door to me, so I'm really, uh, really happy that uh, I was able to get the benefit of so much of her earlier um, memories and uh, her traditional manner of gathering and living with the land. <clears throat> so as Leslie mentioned, um, uh, the first people to meet the Haida were the Spanish and the Santiago with Juan Perez as captain. And in the um, left slide, you'll see a um, artist's rendition. Gordon Mir Miller <coughs> painted this um, painting. And um, he talks, or it, it shows the Haidas coming out and greeting the um, explorers. And in my research, I've been reading about how the Haidas sang and danced and spread feathers. It was very, it was a very much a ceremonial greeting. And uh, the group of men on the right, a uh, hundred years later, they're doing the same thing. They're wearing their robes, they're singing, they're dancing, and they're using their ceremonial clothing. So, a hundred years after my grandmother was born, um, 
the um, the Juan Perez came, and then when my grandmother, a hundred years later, was born, um, there were many changes that happened within the 20th century. But my grandmother continued to to weave, and even though it wasn't, um, it was no longer popular. It didn't bring money. Um, she continued to weave, and she taught my mother to weave. And uh, in turn, my mother taught her three daughters. So the uh, lower left photo is um, my mother on the far left and the three of us, and uh, Holly's son, who later uh, started working at the Total Heritage Center. So he's been very involved in the culture, too. But. Um, these things have been handed down to us. Um, I live in Haida Gwaii. I was born and raised in Ketchikan, Alaska because my nani's second marriage went, uh, she moved to Alaska. But we've always been brought back to Haida Gwaii, and that is our homeland. So uh, I'm home again. <laughs> so I weave. Um, the traditional wool textiles. And our weaving is very much a uh, continuation of basketry weaving. I use three-stranded, two-stranded weaving. And, um, and I, as I weave, I weave the rhythm of the ancestor's tradition. And I, I feel like that connects me to my ancestors, and it definitely connects me to my nani and my mother. And it's just like the adzes that um, the carvers use with their ry rhythm. It all connects us to the past and our, our past traditional skills. So traditionally, the mountain goat fleece was used. And a lot of people say, um, how did the Haidas, um, how could they have been weavers of the mountain goat um, ceremonial robes, um, but they disregard, in that questioning, they disregard the, the trade that happened within our cultures. Um, and the Nahim weaving, which um, the shawl that I'm using right now is an example of the Nahim. And I use the word Nahim because that is a, a Haida and the Tlingit word for what you commonly would know or call Chilkat. So, the, um, the first thing to start uh, traditional nahin weaving would be the mountain goat fleece. And then you, you uh, roll it down your thigh along with yellow cedar. So um, there's a picture of me traditionally rolling it down my thigh. And then I'm hanging it on a very simple loom. And it's, uh, on, uh, the loom is called a gravity-weighted loom. And um, um, this is an old photograph of a robe that was collected in Haida Gwaii. Um, there are several robes that exist in this world that were collected in Haida Gwaii. Um, and um, Curtis, the famous photographer, uh, came to Haida Gwaii and he photographed that and labeled it a Haida dancing blanket. And uh, today, uh, people still use these these robes uh, as ceremonial garments. And there's uh, Jim Hart uh, and uh, Bo Dick's daughter, uh, Carrie, wearing woven robes. Nowadays, we use merino wool. But in the past, it was mountain goat. So I set this video up so that it, you'd see this young man dancing, um, but it didn't come through. <laughs> so, um, but he is dancing, and he's dancing for a chief. The chief, this is an investiture, a gathering and feast for a chief, um, Percy Williams. 
who recently passed away, but this is a photograph that was taken a couple years ago. And he had Parkinson's disease. So he, traditionally, a chief would dance the first, a first dance. And um, so he couldn't dance with his Parkinson's disease. So this young man uh, put on a ceremonial robe and danced on behalf mm -hmm. of the chief. And so these things are still happening and they're still very much important in our culture. Um, this is a photograph of my nanny Selena and my mother weaving. And my mother um, out in the woods, she's gathering cedar bark. And as I said, uh, my mother and my two sisters, they weave uh, with cedar bark and they weave with spruce root. And, um, Ever since we were toddlers, we were brought into the woods to gather materials. So I've always um, been taught the protocol of being in the woods, uh, thanking the trees, and um, and it's um, it's just been a wonderful journey, knowing uh, the old traditions from the, my grandmother, who is a bridge. Um, and a culture bearer for not just our family, but she's also won awards. Uh, she's had the um, governor's award in the Alaska, state of Alaska uh, for her contribution in um, keeping the arts alive. And my mother, in turn, she has an honorary doctorate. Um, she was awarded the highest award that any um, artist in the United States couldn't, um, couldn't have uh, the National Heritage Award. And so um, they have both been um, acknowledged as uh, people who have kept the culture and have shared the culture for future generations. So I weave the chief's robes and um, the far, the the one on the right is a robe that, that was my first robe. It's a full-size robe. And um, the older example of a chief's robe is a robe that is in the uh, uh, Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria. And I recently completed a replication of that robe. Uh, and that particular robe was collected in Haida Gwaii. And it depicts the uh, sea bean. And uh, the sea being was a very uh, special uh, supernatural being. Um, like we say, uh, the power of the sea is something that uh, you need to um, have reverence for. And so uh, we would put the him on our robes. And often it would be more prevalent, it would be depicted as a diving whale. But um, and you often see him on chests also. And the lower right image is a very early uh, silkscreen print of Robert Davidson's. But uh, many times people are confused about the form line. But if you take and uh, trace with your eye uh, the undulating black forms, uh, if you do that slowly and along the, um, uh, the design, then you get the idea of where the wings are, the head, the tail, the talons, the fins. So it, it does take a while, but it, it is um, one that you can trace. This is a robe that the Museum of uh, Canadian History has in their exhibit, um, in their collection. And it's the diving whale, which is the most prevalent pattern. And it was collected on Haida Gwaii. And uh, James Deans, an early ethnologist, talks about this particular robe. And he talks about how he witnessed and saw Haida spinning the wool and um, how they dyed it with their indigenous dyes. And so his voice coming from the past uh, is an important voice for me because it validates the fact that we were weavers of this robe, even though um, by the time this art was noticed, the northern Chilkat people um, started 
uh, had, had continued the um, art where, where the Simpsons and the Haidas had just uh, had put it aside. And so um, so now it's often and uh, popularly called Chilkat. But uh, I just love that the museum uh, there in Ottawa has this robe uh, to remind us that uh, it was collected in Haida Gwaii and according to an earth, early ethnologist, it was woven by a Haida. So here's um, uh, a few pictures of the cedar. We take a cedar tree um, that is huggable. We'd always <laughs> say that was, the tree was huggable. And uh, so you don't want too large a tree and you don't want to take a lot. You want to be able to um, visit that tree and see it heal itself and grow another hundred years. You're very careful with your materials. And before you gather, you thank the tree, you promise uh, the tree that you're going to make useful objects, and uh, you have a dialogue with the plants in the woods. Um, the center uh, painting is done by a um, fur, uh, he was a surgeon on a fur trade boat. So he wasn't an artist. So he did eight portraits in 1793 of um, Haidas. And so the, this collection of this um, person's work is in the Yale University. And uh, uh, so it's, we're fortunate that it's in North America. And uh, I'm hopefully someday going to visit those watercolors because I am a watercolor artist also. And I think that as a weaver and a watercolor artist, I'm going to be able to see things within those those early paintings to learn more about the early garments. So it, it uh, it's a technique that evolved from basketry, and it became quite complex, adding the mountain goat wool and adding the form line designs. So. Um, even, it's a thrill to be in Greece. I've always wanted to be in Greece. Uh, but even before I ever thought I could be in Greece, I, when I talk, I always have this Greek, ancient Greek vase um, image because it talks about the weaving down of the ancient Greek people. And, um, and you, you notice um, on the on the left here, a, a lady is sitting down um, before her basket, and she's weaving down. The Haidas weave down. The the neighbors around them do not. They weave up, and so um, and and then on the far uh, uh, right, there is a simple loom of a, of a native person in the southwest of America. Uh, and she's weaving up, and even the um, simple uh, backstrap looms you weave up. But the height is weaved down, and um, not that many people have retained that early technique. Uh, the Maori people, the Haida people, and um, I think there is some um, a group of people in Sweden that use a loom that you weave down. But um, I always included the Greek people. <laughs> So this is my last slide, and um, it's just an example of some of the things that can be made uh, with this technique, this ancient technique of nahin weaving um, that, um, that has come from the past and continues to be used in, ceremony, in ceremonies today. And I, I've been... Um, I'm just very thankful to come from a weaving family and to have these things passed down to me and have the ability to pass it down to my, my children and to other apprentices um, so that this art that has always been historically um, not a prevalent uh, thing. It, uh, it takes me two and a half years to weave a full-size roll. So, and not in, in this fast-paced world, it's not something that too many people do, um, but I, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunities to do that. And, and um, I always say that there's um, 
there's a, a, there's three um, parts to creating uh, something like this, the ceremonial robes and, and even the canoes and, and the things that take so long, the totem poles. There's, there's the artist, there's their ancestors, and then there's the collectors. So I'm always thankful that there are people in this world who value our work, um, the archives, but also the art museums, and people who privately um, enjoy the art. So um, I thank you for your interest tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I have an example of spruce root, a spruce root hat, and um, I'm wearing an example of Nahim. And so after uh, we answer questions, Leslie and I answer questions from you, um, you're welcome to look at the hat and to uh, I think we'll do a little twine technique. And, uh, I have a living mannequin. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll open it up to questions, I guess. Thank you.